Today's topic is who's winning the battle of ideas, Marx, Keynes, or Mises? And it seems to me that more and more on the national level, on the local level, it's, it's not a, a, a de debate between left and right. It's turning into more of a debate between bigger government or smaller government. And those ideas were debated long ago, and they're still being debated today. And we're going to hear about that debate from Mark Skousen. So won't you welcome Mark Skousen. Thank you. Thank you very much. I kind of kind of wish that we could open up the, uh, we could see and look out here, but it's really quite beautiful out there. But we're in here instead, and we're talking about a subject that is near and dear to my heart, and that is what we now call political economy. We don't call it economics anymore because that's a science. It's all politics now when it comes to economics. And we see this more and more is a topic when we talk about who's winning the battle of ideas. Is it, is it Marx, socialism, communism, totalitarianism? Uh, is it Keynes, which is big government, the welfare state? It's not, it's not all government. It's not laissez-faire, it's halfway in between, big government or the welfare state. That's what we have today, right? And then is it Mises, which is laissez-faire, limited government, not anarchy. Uh, Mises was not an anarchist. He believed that government had a legitimate role. He's a follower of Adam Smith, the founder of laissez-faire economics. And we're going to talk about more about that now. So right now I'm doing a promotion. This is a promotion for my book, The Making of Modern Economics. I brought some copies with me. Uh, this, is the, uh, this is the book right here, The Making of Modern Economics. Um, and uh, it's one of those unique books that's a textbook, but has also become a trade best-selling book. It's something that people enjoy reading, like John Mackey, the CEO of Whole Foods Markets, uh, read the audio book of, my, of The Making of Modern Economics three times, three times. So he found it really beneficial. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my book, but I came up with the title, Who's Winning the Battle of Ideas, Keynes, Marx, or Adam Smith? Uh, I would, to this group, we're going to emphasize Mises, who is a a follower of Adam Smith. Um, <clears throat> so I've been doing a promotion called the book the new socialists fear the most because this is a book that is going to it, that reaches out to young people and not just to us okay and if we are ever going to win the battle of ideas we must win the the minds and the hopes of young people coming out of college. So this is a textbook. This is a book that is used in the coursework and it's, it's fun to read on top of it. It's unusual to have a textbook that you can read uh, and enjoy yourself. What's really good about it is the first history of economics that actually has pictures in it. Can you imagine? <laughs> pictures and stories. So you see Kids don't have to read it. They can just look at the pictures. <laughs> My wife and I teach at Chapman University, and it's really fun to have one foot in the academic world among students. Joanne teaches uh, English literature and poetry. Uh, I teach economics, business, and finance. One of the things that shocked me, I, I just did my midterm before I came here. Uh, and I have 39 students, and three out, of the, three out of the 39 students did not do a math problem that I had on the midterm, and their excuse was, I don't have a calculator. In other words, they were not able to do the math mentally. They had to depend on the calculator. And of course, I'm finding this for myself sometimes. You know, I say, oh, it's just too hard to add it up. Let me get my calculator out. Well, it's becoming something even, much worse for young people. I, I don't think they're really learning the math. Uh, <clears throat> so what are my contributions in my making of modern economics? The first contribution is 
I reject the traditional right-left dichotomy uh, political labeling, which you hear over and over again. He's a leftist, he's a rightist. I reject that because it's divisive, and believe me, we have too much divisiveness in today's world. You all agree with that? Too much division. We're, we're, we're destroying the unity that Americans used to enjoy. And I think a lot of it is due to this demonizing. You're a leftist, you're a rightist, now we know what you think and we're not interested in discussing. We now start the name calling. So I've rejected that in favor of the totem pole approach or what we might call uh, the, the polar, you know, who's on top and who's on the bottom, top to bottom type of approach. So on the top, and it's a little bit hard to see that, but on the top is Adam Smith, Mises, others, Hayek, Milton Friedman. The free market economists are on the top because their economies that have followed the advice of laissez-faire have done better than the other countries. And then in the middle, uh, below Adam Smith, I have Marx, I have Keynes and Keynesian economics, big government, and then low man on the totem pole is Karl Marx. So I think this is a much better approach. So that's the first thing that I do in my book. The second contribution is I felt it was really important to have an alternative to Robert Heilbroner's book, The Worldly Philosophers. Now Robert Heilbroner has the most, the best selling book in economics today. Over three million copies have been sold. The problem is that Robert Heilbroner is a socialist. And his favorite economists are Marx, Keynes, and Veblen. That's not the kind of textbook we want for our students to learn from. So my favorites in the making of modern economics are Adam Smith, J.B. Say, the great French economist, Ludwig von Mises, the great Austrian economist, and his sidekick, Friedrich Hayek. You may have heard of these names, Mises and Hayek. And Milton Friedman, the great Chicago free market economist. Okay, so those are my favorites, and that kind of comes out in the writing of this textbook. So this can be a little hard to read here, contribution number three, but let me just explain what I'm trying to do here. Prior to the writing of my book, no one had, uh, economics was not a story. It was just, here's one economist, here's your, uh, their views, here's another economist, that's your views, here's another economist, that's your views, it's a hodgepodge. I changed it to telling a story. And when you have a story, what do you need? My wife's a professor, so she's a professor of English, so when you're writing a story, what do you need? <laughs> The storyline arc. So you got to have a hero, you got to have a protagonist who, who has a certain set of beliefs, and you have to have enemies who attack the hero, sometimes leave him for dead, but they're resuscitated by his supporters, and you got to have a good American ending. It's got to triumph in the end, and that's what I have in this book. So who is the hero of the making of modern economics? It's Adam Smith and his school of economics, free market school of economics, free trade, limited government, balanced budgets, the gold standard. These are the basic principles of Adam Smith and he's the hero of the book. And he called his, his model the system of natural liberty. System of natural liberty. Um, and the French called it laissez-faire. Leave me alone. Let me do what I want to do. Pursue your own excellence. And of course, this appeals to young people. Don't tell me what to do. I will decide for myself. So see, our book can appeal to those people. Laissez-faire should appeal to young people. So Adam Smith is attacked. His system of natural liberty is attacked by the Marxists, by the socialists, by the Keynesians sometimes left for dead, but then he's resuscitated by the Austrian School of Economics, the Chicago School of Economics, uh, and then triumphs in the end with the collapse of the Berlin Wall. So that's, that's the whole idea of the book. 
Uh, now this, you can't see this very well, but this is a picture of the Wealth of Nations that was published in 1966 by Regnery Publishing, free market publisher, with an introduction by Ludwig von Mises. And this introduction basically says, Smith's works are the consummation, summarization and perfection, the keystone of a marvelous system of ideas. The publication date, 1776, marks the dawn of freedom, both politically and economically. I, I did ask one of my students, I said, so what happened in the year 1776? Is there anything that you can remember that happened in the year 1776? <laughs> and I called on this one student and she said, ah, oh, kind of sounds familiar. I just can't quite. Other students, students? And so one or two other students said, Declaration of Independence, Declaration of Independence. No, it was a foreign student. No, no, it's an American student, <laughs> a high school graduate. <laughs> And let me tell you, the, the Chapman students are, are pretty bright. Wouldn't you say so, Joanne? Yeah. I mean, you know, the fact that they don't, I don't blame them. I blame the teachers. Yeah. The teachers are responsible for giving that information out. Okay. So 1776 was the Declaration of Economic Independence also, because what great book was published in 1776? Mm -hmm. Students. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith, a declaration of economic independence, along with Jefferson's declaration of political independence. So Mises says the publication date, 1776, marks the dawn of freedom, both politically and economic. It paved the way for unprecedented achievements of laissez-faire capitalism. And then he endorses the book, The Wealth of Nations. So Mises is one of those who is in favor of supporting and resuscitating the Adam Smith model. That's what I wanted to say. Now, in the Wealth of Nations, there's a, there are three aspects to uh, his system of natural liberty. These three, three are, and I know you're all taking notes, I can tell. Oh, she's taking notes, okay. You're taking notes, good. My A student over here, <laughs> A student. <laughs> Uh, my wife, she's writing it down right now. I am. I'm, I'm memorizing it all. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't already have it memorized. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there are three great aspects to a system of natural liberty. And you can see these. Let's see if you can see the three, the three keystones of a uh, system of natural liberty. And this quote from Adam Smith, every man, as long as he does not violate the laws of justice, is left perfectly free to pursue his, pursue his own interests in his own way and to bring both his industry and capital into competition with those of any other man or order of men. So you can see the three principles are one, justice, two, freedom, freedom and three, competition. competition. And if you have that, if you have that in society, laissez-faire capitalism can flourish. And you're not going to have the problems that are often associated with inequality and uh, unfairness and the things that people are constantly complaining about. Uh, that's, that's really the key that Adam Smith is saying here. So in my book, every economist is judged or ranked to the extent that they improve upon or add to the house that Adam Smith built, or they're trying to tear it down, undermine it, thwart, and build something else. The greatest threat, I have several chapters on the greatest threat to the Adam Smith model are communism and socialism. Keynesianism also, and we'll get to that in just a minute. But the rise of Marxist socialism in 1917 with the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. Because now for the first time, we had an experiment. The Marxists had talked about communism but now we have a country that's actually doing what Marx suggested. Now we got an experiment. We can see if it works or not, right? Now you'd be interested in knowing that when the Marxist revolution got started in the first 20 or 30 years, 
it was considered a big success. There were journalists who went over to Russia and they were shown the good side and not the bad side. Smart work on the part of Lenin and Stalin. And so these journalists wrote back and we've seen the future. And there it is. Communist Russia is the future. Because we saw people going to art uh, museums. We saw people playing chess. We saw people walking in the parks. We saw them in the schools. They lived in these really nice homes. That's the future. And nobody is unemployed like they are in the United States in the Great Depression or in England in the West that were suffering from the Great Depression. No, no, not there. So a lot of people said the future is socialism. Socialism became very popular. And it was at that time that Ludwig von Mises came out in 1920 with a book called Socialism. I talk about it in the chapter on Mises. I have a whole chapter on Mises. Because he was the first economist to said, hey, you know, don't think socialism works. I mean, you may say it works, but it's going to be proven at some point that it doesn't work. It doesn't deliver the goods. And why is that? And he used the example of a bridge. He said, now suppose you want to build a bridge, but under communism, you have no prices. You produce everything because a totalitarian dictator from on top says, okay, we're going to build a bridge. How much does it cost? Who cares? We'll just get the materials and we'll build a bridge. We can do that. The Egyptians did that. They build pyramids without money, without prices. Why can't we do it? But, the, but Mises says there's a problem. Do you build a bridge out of wood? Do you build a bridge out of steel? Do you build a bridge out of iron? Do you build a bridge out of bamboo? You have no prices. You can't tell what is profitable and what isn't. This is impossible. Economic calculation of socialist commonwealth is impossible. There is only groping the darkness. Socialism is the abolition of rational economy. So he said that in 1920. Did anyone believe him? No. He lost that debate. The socialist said, you need pricing? We'll just make up prices. And we'll see what's in surplus and what's in shortage, and that will tell us what to, what to produce. The socialists, the market socialists, won that debate. So Mises was uh, not a popular man. So Hayek was his younger colleague, was not a student of Mises, younger colleague, won the Nobel Prize in 1974. <laughs> So he's quite well known, more known than Mises is among economists. But uh, Hayek got so fed up with the socialists have won business that he wrote a book called The Road to Serfdom. Uh, do you think that's a positive book or a negative book? Uh, he's talking, and guess what year he wrote it in? 1944. All right, she is, she, my A student is, she, she can read. All right, this is great. All right, 1944. So, she had a, chapter 10 is the most famous chapter of this book. And in this book it says, why the worst get on top, speaking politically. Why the worst get on top. Now, if it was 1944, would you agree with that? Yep. So, who were... Who were the leaders at that time? FDR. FDR, which, you know, he was more of a Keynesian. He wasn't into total socialism, just partial socialism, right? But the other dictators were in total socialism. Hitler, Mussolini, and Stalin, the big three. So you can see why. And even Hayek, Hayek his entire life was a pessimist. Even at the end of his life when... Margaret Thatcher and, and Ronald Reagan had been elected. These were exceptions to the rule, but he had a hard time accepting it. I read the, his updated uh, introduction to his book, looking back, and he said, ah, I just don't think it can happen. The worst still get on top. And of course, look at today. No, I'm just kidding. I know a lot of you are big Trump supporters. I understand. 
choose your, choose your medicine. All right. Uh, <laughs> anyway, the road to serfdom. However, remember I mentioned Heilbronner. Robert Heilbronner wrote The Worldly Philosophers, was a socialist, most popular book ever written in the history of economics until my book came along, of course. Yeah. Uh, so Heilbronner, socialist, wrote a very interesting article in 1989, 1990, in the New Yorker, and this is what he said. The contest between capitalism and socialism is over. This is 50 years later, 75 years later. It turns out that Mises was right after all. What an admission. This man's a socialist. And he's saying Mises was right after all. Socialism has been, become a great tragedy this century. Capitalism organized the material affairs of humankind more satisfactorily than socialism. Wow, what an admission. So this suggests that maybe we have, we, we see a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. I know here at the Grassroot Institute, you're saying to yourself, can we ever, there's the light out there, you can see the light at the end of the tunnel, and it's getting brighter, something's coming toward us. The Jones Act is going to be repealed. <laughs> Hallelujah. We have to have a big party. The Jones, par Jones Act party when Jones Act is repealed. That would demonstrate that we have won something important really important. But Heilbronner, the triumph of capitalism. All right. So I have a good ending in the book, the triumph of Smithian economics and Misesian economics, the collapse of the Berlin Wall and the Soviet socialist central planning model in 1991. The end of history. What Francis Fujiyami, Fuji, Fujiyami said, the end of history. So the classical model of Adam Smith is the one that we advocate, the Grassroot Institute advocates. Number one, savings and entrepreneur capital are the key to economic growth. See if we can agree with all of that, right? Two, limited government and low taxes, laissez-faire. Government should not be running businesses, stuff like that. Number three, balanced budget. We have to live within a budget. Uh, why can't uh, companies have to live within a budget, except for Elon Musk and Tesla, there are exceptions. Uh, balanced budgets, how important is that? For sound money, we don't, we don't think inflation is good. Is inflation good here in Hawaii? Don't you just love it when prices go up? Yeah, we believe in sound money. And finally, free trade, if only we had free trade. That would be uh, the ideals. However, there is another enemy out there. And so we, we beat Marx in many ways. I mean, even the socialists, the Bernie Sanders and AOC, these people, they don't really believe in socialism. Because socialism is actually the ownership of the means of production. And they're not advocating that. They're not advocating nationalizing the airline industry again, or a hotel business, uh, or the farms and all that sort of thing. They're advocating fascism, really. Control, regulate, tax. That's what they're advocating. So it's not, it's not pure socialism. So Marx has lost that debate. But Keynes, the middle guy, big government, the welfare state proponents, that's the real, that's your real enemy today. So what are the economic consequences of Mr. Keynes? Number one, consumer society and anti-savings mentality. Not saving enough money, not living within our budget. Two, the growth of big government, the welfare state and progressive taxation. Those are threats. Chronic deficits and national debt, that's a threat. Because that means more inflation. Four, threat of inflation, and five, protectionism. Protectionism. So how are we doing on those scores? Well, here's the first one. Are Americans saving enough? Downward trend, although recently a little bit of bump up, which is good, but people aren't saving enough. We need to save more. I firmly believe in Ben Franklin's three virtues, uh, industry, thrift, and prudence. Industry, thrift, and prudence. And if you have adopted these three principles in your life, 
you're successful. You're here today because you adopted industry thrift and prudence. So who are the hardest working people in the world? According to a recent survey, anybody want to guess what country? China. No, you're close. Korea, number one. But it will shock you to hear what number two is. Mexico. Mexicans are the second hardest working people in the world. So that's kind of a surprise, but anyway, saving is really important. And Asians, of course, save a lot. The Swiss save a lot. There's a lot of people that save. And if you save a lot and you invest that savings properly, if you live within your means, if you run a company that has retained earnings, so important, because you know the recession is going to come, retained earnings. I teach a business class. And we talk about what you can do with your money. Businesses in the good times tend to spend too much. They don't hold back enough. Because when that recession hits, they may go under because they don't have enough retained earnings. The increasing size of debt. Now, this is the US, but it, it applies almost everywhere. Wars cause government to grow a lot. And then it comes back down. But see, the upward trend is still there. Trump has not changed that. He has not drained the swamp, as he promised. He's big on promises, right? Going to promise the American people are going to drain the swamp. Well, he's swimming in the swamp. I'm sorry, folks, but there isn't a lot of... Where's the Department of Education? That is the most corrupt department in the United States. Trillions of dollars, billions of dollars. I don't know how much, but Republicans have promised all the way back to Ronald Reagan's time to end the Department of Education. My wife has had to deal with the Department of Education at Mercy College. And, uh, you know, it's a waste of money. You agree? There's more to it than that. There's, there is? I think that's it. It's, it's I, I'm, I'm more concerned about the fact that it's top-down management and that, um, and that the colleges are more concerned about what the Department of Ed needs than what the students need. It, it just yeah. changes their focus. And, and a lot of the money is going to the administration rather than down to the level of the teachers. And that's, I think, an unfortunate part of that, that business. But anyway, government size is still a major problem. Chronic deficit spending, especially after World War II, because as you can see, yeah, you run deficits during the war. We all understand that. But after the war, in peacetime, uh, we have chronic deficit spending. Now, that is the legacy of Keynesian economics. As Keynesian economics teaches you that you don't need, you, we owe it to ourselves and we don't need to pay it off. As long as we can pay the interest on the loan, uh, on the debt, that's all that matters. And from a financial point of view, that is correct. That is correct. If you can finance the debt, your business debt or your family debt, your mortgage, if you can finance it, that's okay. But what if interest rates go up, which they're headed up now dramatically, that, or not dramatically, slowly. And if interest rates go up high enough, we're going to face a major crisis especially when the unfunded liabilities of Social Security and Medicare catch on. But it's a serious problem. Again, this is one of those promises that Trump made during the election that he would reduce the national debt. And instead, it's growing very fast. And we're at full employment. Even Keynesian economists are against deficit spending when you have full employment. Welcome. The rise of inflation in the United States. Now, I want you to look at this chart really carefully. Is this, I don't know if this, uh, it, there's a red light, but it's hard to see here. Okay, so this is from 1775, consumer price index from 1775 to 2012. And as you can see, the only time you had inflation was during wartime. But then look what happened after World War II. So it wasn't the creation of the Federal Reserve per se that caused inflation, because you still had the same general trend here. But then after World War II, inflation took off, 
and has never looked back. Why? Why did that happen? I asked my students on the final. Did they have an answer? Did money? Yes, they did. They had an answer, and it wasn't the creation of the Federal Reserve. It was adoption of Keynesian economics taught in all the schools. That's what caused inflation. That's another reason I've written this book, saying inflation is not necessary to create prosperity. There have been many times in American history where the 1920s, the 1980s, the 1890s, there's been decades where we've had no, virtually no inflation and you've had prosperity. So that's what we need to teach in our classes. So you can tell from all five of these charts that Keynesian economics still dominates the way we think today. What about free trade? Here's our fifth one, free trade. Now, up until recently, you can see the long-term downward trend in trade. But the Trump uh, protectionist measures, the trade war, dot, dot, dot going up. He says this is only a method. My long-term goal is, is zero tariffs to reduce tariffs. Occasionally he'll say that. But then there's other times where he says, you know, it's America first and bring all these jobs back. And uh, the, the iPhone needs to be made completely in the United States, the iPhone. Well, how much would it cost an iPhone if it was completely made in the United States? <laughs> <laughs> Who said that? 10,000 bucks, yeah. It would cost a lot. We don't know how much, but believe me, costs would go up pretty dramatically. All right. So this is, um, this is a question mark. Are we moving back to an era of protectionism? If we are, that's not good. That's a bad sign. So, uh, this is my favorite Ludwig von Mises quote. Government is the only agency that can take a valuable commodity like paper, slap some ink on it, make it totally worthless. Yeah. And there's a country that's happening right now. What country is that? Venezuela. Venezuela. Yeah, I spent a year in Venezuela. I, I weep for those, kind of, I mean, 32 million people that are starving, no electricity. Three million Venezuelans have left. And we're sitting there, you know, fiddling while Caracas burns. And uh, one other thing I would say that's very important about Venezuela. Venezuela is not, not being run by socialists. Venezuela is being run by communists. And there's a big difference, socialists, adopt their strategies through democracy. Communism, the end justifies the means. They will use democracy to get into office, which Chavez and Maduro did, kind of. They were corrupt in many ways. And everything. But they cannot be kicked out by voters. Voters will never remove them from office. They must be militarily removed. That's what happened in Chile very controversial with Allende, uh, uh, but uh, in my opinion, that's the only thing that happened. And hopefully it's internally Venezuelan military, but that's, you know, one thing that the communists learned from the Chile model is you have to control the military, or otherwise you will be kicked out. So people are starving there, and the communists still are in control. It's a very, it's a quagmire. I don't know how we're going to be able to solve that problem. But meanwhile, we take a long-term point of view. It's kind of highlights of my book and some of the things I have. My chapter six is called Marx Madness, Plunges Economics into a New Dark Age. So you kind of know how I feel about Karl Marx, right? <laughs> so this, my book was translated into Chinese. And so the censors, I was wondering, well, how can the censors handle a title like that? Are they going to allow that? So I picked up the Chinese edition, showed it to a translator. And I said, can you look at this chapter? Does it say Marx, madness, plunges economics, new dark age? Is it positive or negative? Oh, very positive. I said, really? Is the headline's very positive? He says, yes. The title is 
Karl Marx and classical economics. <laughs> That's how they translated it. And I said, well, what about the copy itself inside the copy? So he starts reading and he says, oh, very negative. So in other words, the, the, the translator was very clever. He knew that if he had that, uh, that title, it, it would have never been published in China. But by, you know, the Chinese censors never read the chapter. And uh, at the University of the Philippines, my book was, uh, uh, was censored. They actually removed it from the library at the University of the Philippines because one student who had read my book uh, took the entire chapter and typed it and then emailed it to all of his friends because uh, University of the Philippines is a hotbed of Marxism. And as a result, he converted all of his students who read it, said, oh, this that's not for us. We don't want to head up in the mountains and do the Che Guevara kind of thing, which the, Philip, the communists in Philippines do. They have you go up to these camps and you spend a whole week there to become revolutionaries. And this, my book destroyed their revolutionary fever and even converted her, uh, his teacher there. So the communists found out about this and they said, we got to get rid of this book. And so my book was, was removed from the, uh, from the library. Um, so I have some fun chapters. You can see my titles, Adam Smith, it all started with Adam, kind of a religious overtone. Uh, my Austrian title on Mises and Hayek and so on is called Out of the Blue Danube. Uh, my Milton Friedman, Milton Friedman loved my chapter on him. It's very, very positive. Called Milton's Paradise. Milton's oh. Paradise. Yeah. And of course, Keynes. I was going to do Candy Keynes, but <laughs> the Keynes Mutiny, for those who've been around, know about the Keynes Mutiny. It's a play on you know, one of the old films. So uh, students like my book because it's full of humor. And it's got stories and it's got pictures. That's the key. All right. So um, a couple of highlights of my book. Um, uh, I've talked about that already, but I did want to talk about, uh, by the way, if, if you have questions, think, if you have questions about anything I've talked about here, feel free to raise your hand. Uh, be glad to answer your questions. Uh, but I want to mention a couple of things. One is, uh, <clears throat> this book landed me a position at Columbia University and Columbia Business School. And I was able to do that because my wife and I, in uh, the early 2000s, when I had the first edition of the book out, uh, went over and visited William F. Buckley Jr., Bill Buckley. Remember him of National Review? Bill Buckley? Mm -hmm. Wonderful man. My wife and I had lunch with him. And then afterwards, he gave us a tour of his home in Stamford, Connecticut. Beautiful home. We went into the, uh, his library, and he says, pick a book, pick a book, because he had all of his books there, and I picked a book of him, uh, sail. Oh, he wrote several beautiful books about sailing. So I got one of those, he autographed it, and then at the last minute, I had a copy of The Making of Modern Economics, and I autographed it and gave it to him, not thinking anything of it. <clears throat> A month later, National Review had a big review of my book by William F. Buckley saying, this is fantastic, I love your book, and it should be, every student should have it, and so on. And John Whitney, a professor of fi uh, finance uh, and business at Columbia Business School, read the review, called me on the phone and said, would you like to give a lecture? I gave the lecture, and then he said, you know, I'm ready to retire, and I want you to take my position, place." So uh, because of my book, because of Buckley, because of John Whitney, I was teaching at one of the finest institutions in the country. So Columbia, actually, you have it spelled with two O's. Do you mean Columbia, the country, the uh, University of Columbia? No, that, in fact, that is a misspelling by my, uh, my, my typesetter that he. I'll, I'll send him a quick note. Yeah, please do. <laughs> and Ned, my, uh, who does my PowerPoint. You, who was that you again my a student came up with that that's you yeah you're right no 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 this is the 
This is the Columbia University in New York City, not, not the one in Bogota, Columbia. <laughs> what was he smoking when he saw that? I don't know, yeah. And then finally, I want to mention the special pub date, because that's an important uh, uh, personal thing uh, in, in, my, uh, in my view. So um, I mentioned that Adam Smith is the heroic figure of the book and uh, totally transformed my view of how economics should be taught. So you have the hero, enemies, supporters, and a, good, and a triumph at the end. So whenever you write a book, it takes forever to write it. There's editing, you send it to the publisher, they have comments and change. So you never know what the pub date's going to be. So the pub date is a very special date. It's the day the book is released and sold on Amazon and in bookstores. And this date was March 9th in the year 2000. March 9th in the year 2000. And I, I said, March 9th, boy, that sounds really familiar. Is it my wife's birthday? No. No. Nope. <laughs> March 21st. Is it our anniversary? No. Nope. No, it's not that. So I was racking my brain, and finally it dawned on me. March 9th is the anniversary date, is the date in 1776 that the Wealth of Nations was published. And so, a wonderful coincidence. I would like to think that I was inspired by Adam Smith's model to come up with this book. So I'm, I'm really proud of this book, and uh, it's changing people's lives. And so, uh, I hope you can consider, uh, by the way, my book's been translated into Arabic. And there are three, a big three economists on there, right? Adam Smith, Keynes, and Marx. But guess who's on top in this Arabic translation? Marx, Marx is on top. So the, the designer of the translation obviously didn't read my book. But it does demonstrate the challenge that we face. What, is, what, are, what are they interested in? Marx. You have a question. I have yes. a question. So you said in these different countries, um, Marx keeps rising to the top all the time. Why is that? Well, it's the appeal. I saw a cartoon the other day with two doors in it. One door was hard work, give half your money to the government. Okay. And the other door is... Free, free goods and services, everything you want, no taxes. And so they showed the, all these lemmings, tons of people lined up to go into that door and nobody going into the other door of hard work and taxes. So the Marxists are very good, I think, at the appeal. Just like uh, Ocasio-Cortez, who I call Castro Light, is, is uh, very appealing, and, and so is Bernie Sanders. Okay, we want, uh, first of all, we're gonna forgive all your student loans. Well, who could be against that? Uh, I mean, I have a daughter who has still a $30,000 outstanding loan. She's tried to pay it down and stuff like that, but if it was forgiven, she'd go for that. Um, free tuition, you know, at least community college. Uh, uh, Medicare for all, uh, no charge, I mean, these are appealing. Minimum wage, you know, you have people, come on, let's have a living wage. Minimum wage at $7, who can live on that? So we need $15. Um, Amazon was pressured into $15 a day minimum wage. But guess what they gave up? Uh, 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 sorry, an hour, an hour. Uh, guess what they gave up? Amazon said no more stock options. Yeah, so... Uh, Micro, Microsoft created 30,000 millionaires out of their employees through stock options. Uh, our answer, we have a really great answer, it's called democratic capitalism. This is what we need to promote. Democratic capitalism. This will appeal to young people because it means you get part of the action. That's what they want. And that's what they should have. And so uh, uh, Microsoft is a classic example that I teach in my business courses. I said, you, when you're running a business and you have all those employees working for you, you better make sure you share the profits some way 
while you don't destroy the initiative, the incentives, you still need to let them participate. And stock options is a great way to do it. John Mackey, of, uh, CEO of Whole Foods, is a great believer in conscious capitalism, and he believes in stock options, uh, until Amazon took, took them over. <laughs> uh, could be a problem. Anyway, uh, uh, more on my book here. Uh, I'll pass on these, although number two ranked the Ayn Rand Institute's top 10 list of must-read books in economics. The first, number one was Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson. Um, so I've got some positive reviews here, I, you know, just a whole bunch of people, including a few negative reviews. So uh, there is another typo. It says, tonight, only $30. Today. <laughs> <laughs> but the price is normally... You know, it's a textbook type of thing, so people, you know how these textbook, uh, Rutledge, and Rutledge is my publisher, which by the way was a publisher of Hayek's works, so I'm very pleased that Rutledge is now uh, publishing my book, and so it's normally $49.95, but uh, today $30, so if you're interested in autograph copy, uh, uh, we cash or credit my wife will be handling the uh, the orders so the books are out there on the side if you're interested in in picking up a copy I brought a couple of other of my books as well but that's the primary one but I, I think it's valuable to get the word out we need there are books out there that can change the world and can influence our rising generation I think that's really the key Thank you all very much. Thank you. Well, if there's uh, yeah. any questions for yeah. um, yes, ma'am, Professor. Well, one of the factors that you talked about was justice. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to understand in any economic system, any, how you can have justice when a portion of your population. I looked it up, and I'm sure the statistics wrong, but. <clears throat> I call it antisocial personality now, but 1% of the general population is psychopathic, 4% is sociopathic, there are high IQ um, psychopaths, low IQ so psychopaths, and vice versa with the uh, sociopath, and some people say they're the same. So how do you have justice in any system when you have people who don't function the same way and don't have shared values? Um, well, it's a, it's a tough question. Uh, Adam Smith, huh? Could you repeat the question? Well, he, she's just saying, uh, how do you have people who, how do you have justice in today's world when you have so many people who are kind of mixed up, you know, uh, psychopaths and, and, and so forth. Um, I still think that's a minority and that the majority of people are, if they just understood um, the basic principles of life, I think that they can get it. Now, Adam, Adam Smith didn't, never said his system of natural liberty, what? And one of the problems is, and we're going to talk about this uh, at another talk in, on a, 
on Oahu, and that is freedom. For, so freedom means different things to different people. Uh, for example, we believe that we have the freedom to keep our money and our goods and services and use them as we please as long as we don't interfere with others. But there's another definition of freedom, and that's the freedom from want and the freedom from fear that FDR talked about. And so you have people who say, listen, I'm not free because I don't have enough money. But if you give me enough money, that'll give me the freedom to do what I want, to be an artist or painter or, or uh, pursue whatever I'd like to do because I don't want to have to work for the man, right? So there's that other form of freedom. And that is a difficulty to deal with. Um, but Adam Smith's uh, system of natural liberty is not something of perfection. He said, a country can go from the lowest level of barbarism to the highest level of opulence through the principles of peace, uh, free trade, sound money, and a tolerable administration of justice. Tolerable administration of justice. He didn't say a perfect administration of justice. Nobody has that. If you're familiar with the Economic Freedom Index that the Fraser Institute and the Heritage Foundation does, they talk about five criteria of economic freedom. They talk about government spending. They talk about trade. Uh, they talk about the rule of law, the justice system. That's important. Uh, they talk about business regulation. Uh, so they have all of these criteria, but studies have shown that the, the rule of law, justice system, is your most important of the five factors of economic freedom and prosperity. So you, this is talking about corruption and uh, independent judiciary. You've got to have this. And the U.S. has, has some corruption and some uh, uh, problems uh, uh, with the justice system, but nowhere near Venezuela or some of these other countries. Uh, there's been all kinds of studies uh, on that. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, the question is whether you're going to let a tiny percentage of the population determine the rules for everybody. Well, and that's right. And that's what democracy truly understood means. It means that uh, you can't just have a small number of people telling you what to do. Now, at the same time, you still need to defend the basic rights of individuals. Uh, and that's what the Bill of Rights is all about. So I think the Constitution does have a pretty good, tolerable administration of justice in that respect. But it is a, it is a problem. Um, okay, so in the last uh, election, there was referendums in 30 states. They all raised the minimum wage. Now, we teach all of our students. I teach my students. Other economists teach students all the time that there's a price to pay for raising the minimum wage and that causes layoffs and often hurts minorities and you get a lot of businesses that convert to automation and machines instead of into there's all kinds of unintended consequences due to a raise the minimum wage we teach all of these students didn't matter they all voted for it so well, how do we respond to that do we say well let's have a benevolent despot called Ludwig von Mises at the top saying no to minimum wages. Even though you're for it, we're not going to allow it. Do we do that? I argue that democracy is good. The referendum system is good because it tells us what, what, what kind of work we need to do to, to educate people to realize minimum wage is a bad deal. So uh, I'm an advocate of democracy. Uh, at Freedom Fest, which you all have a little brochure on, I hope you can all fly over. There are non-stops, by the way, to Vegas. Non-stops. <laughs> Did you know that? Non-stops. Yes, yes, it's true. Maybe not from here, but from, oh, yes. from Honolulu. Oh, even from here. Oh, okay. So not to go gamble, but we have our intellectual feast. A lot of the uh, grassroots people come to Freedom Fest, uh, and uh, we have a great time. My wife does a great film festival there, uh, Libertarian Film Festival. 
uh, people, I mean, she gets hundreds of people who come to watch these shows. I don't understand why people would come watch a movie instead of listening to a lecture. <laughs> oh, oh, she's so, she's so hard on her husband. <laughs> But anyway, we have Kevin O'Leary, uh, Kevin, o yeah, Kevin O'Leary of Shark Tank is our keynote speaker, and well, he's going to debate, yeah, Mr. Wonderful is going to debate uh, John Mackey on what is the purpose of business. John Mackey says it has a higher purpose than just making money. Kevin O'Leary says it's only about the money. If you want a friend, buy a dog. So it will be a pretty interesting <laughs> debate. We have Penn Gillette coming from Penn and Teller, who's coming for the first time, so that's going to be cool. And we have, you know, all, we always have uh, Senator Rand Paul, Mike Lee, a lot of these people are congressmen coming as well. I'm sure we'll have some representatives from Hawaii, no doubt. But anyway, it's, it's a lot of fun. I hope you can come to our, our big event. Other questions? Uh, one more, yes. I believe we're headed for an economic collapse. What do you think? So uh, I, I'm a financial writer, and I do have some copies of my newsletter. If you're interested, anybody, let me know. Uh, I've got some I brought here with me. Um, so I, I tend to be in more of the bullish camp, thinking that uh, uh, while there are serious problems that our country faces, and I've pointed out to you, like the chronic deficits and the national debt, rising interest rates, Unfunded liability problems. There's, there's a lot of these problems associated with it. I have learned in my long life as a financial advisor, the markets still go up more than they go down. And every 10 years or so, we may have a crash, but then they recover. America is exceptional in that respect. So um, I, think, I think you have to be very careful. Timing has to be good on this, because if you're a perma bear, if you're constantly negative, if you fall into these, the market's going to crash anyway tomorrow, you're going to stay in cash, and you're going to missing out on some incredible profits uh, that, that the bulls have made, including Warren Buffett and all of, all of the major uh, people who are optimists, who are optimists. Uh, I've met uh, gold bugs and perma bears and doom and gloomers who have lost 70% of their portfolio. Why? They got out of the stock market and they bought into the doom and gloom at financial conferences and they bought penny gold stocks and they've lost 70% of their money. And as I said to a couple of them who were at a conference, a gold bug conference, I said, you lost 70% of your money. Why are you still here? And they said, we've doubled down. We doubled down. And the very next year, I met one of them who said, yeah, I made a million dollars because you had a, a bit of a recovery in these penny stocks. And I said, sell, sell, take your, and, and that would have been good counsel for those people. So I think you have to be very careful. It's very easy to get caught up in all the negatives you need to have a balanced approach and make up your own mind. And I think you need to hedge to some extent. Okay, I mean, I'm 100% invested, but I do have a gold position. I carry in my back pocket a gold coin at all times. <laughs> Mexican 50 peso gold coin, just in case I die on the spot and I need, you know, a pine box to bury me in. So here, here's this. Inflation, uh, the stock market has outperformed over the long term, the inflation rate. So that's been good. But if you have a Venezuela style hyperinflation, that's why I've got these. Right. And, and, and these. I got gold and silver. I carry them with me all the time. This is our symbol of Freedom Fest, by the way. Yes, yes. There, a monetary collapse can occur if we can no longer finance the deficit. And finance the deficit with actual taxes, not with printing of money, which is what AOC and these other people have this new modern monetary policy. And that is dangerous. That's Venez We're headed toward Venezuela in that respect, and that's very disruptive. So it hasn't happened yet, and I don't see it happening anytime soon. Uh, somewhere down there, we need to know the sign. I write my newsletter to know the signs of the times. That's that's really the attitude. So yes. The whole, yeah. the whole national conversation with the media, um, you know, regurgitating every day. 
It's really wrong. I mean, we're calling AOC and these other idiots, we're calling them socialists, and they're really not. You're saying they're fascist. It's more fascist. Well, yeah, because they're not adopting the traditional view that socialism is the total control of the economy, of nationalization and controlling the means of production. They're not saying that. They're talking about controlling it, regulating it, and taxing it. They want to tax you at a 70% tax rate. That's not 100%. But it's certainly much higher than the, than the rates that we have right now. Uh, it's confiscatory, if you will. So yes, we need, to, uh, we need to address these issues and explain why it's a very dangerous thing to go. Uh, and s sadly, a lot of people don't realize that with progressive taxation and inflation, they you know, you, you get knocked up into higher and higher tax brackets automatically through inflation. And so it's a very dangerous type of situation. Yes? Yeah, I have a theory I want you to consider. Uh, the, uh, I, my thoughts are maybe we won't have very much inflation. In fact, I, and I'll justify it. I'm not saying this is a truth. I'm saying you should consider it. I know you commented a couple times that interest rates, you have a hunch they might be going up. But the biggest market in the world is the bond market, agreed? Much bigger than the stock market. That's so what they say. We don't know how much, but generally speaking. So the, the bond market is huge. And the bond market right now in the world, in the U.S., is, I mean, you look at the 10 year bond, it's what, 2.55. Okay, that's. Saying the bond market is supposedly smarter than the markets are supposedly smarter than us. Not me, smarter than the bond. bond market is telling us the world bond market, the US Treasury bond market, and most of the bonds, many of the bonds for most governments, the Germans, the Japan, are negative numbers. So if this bond market is so freaking smart, why don't we listen to it? What is it saying? The 10 year bond market is saying 2.5% <coughs> is your, the bond market's willing to accept that. That's telling you, and we should be open to this story, that there's not gonna be much inflation. And if there's not gonna be much inflation, the ability to pay the debt is, is still difficult because you still gotta pay back the principal. But we could be having a world which we don't anticipate, most people don't, but we have almost no inflation. And that's the way it should work in a market economy because each year you build a car for less, a house for less. If we were on a gold standard, everybody would be building everything for less. Even Jimmy Haynes would sell his gas for less. Well, and my... Anyway, uh, that's my theory. Yeah, and, and look, uh, this is the traditional view. Certainly the bondholders think they control the credit markets, uh, not the Fed, not the Fed. Yeah. However, you could have made the same argument back in 1975 when bond prices, you know, you had uh, 30 year bonds yielding 8%, and of course they went to 18%, even though the bond traders said, hey, it's not a problem. So just like futures traders are not always right, sometimes they're wrong. Uh, I, I, at the same time, the gold bugs were wrong because I remember well in the 70s, I was just starting out in this business and uh, you had a lot of the gold bugs saying hyperinflation, runaway inflation. And they were wrong too because they said we went off to the gold standard, we went off the gold and the silver standard and so we have no discipline. We have no discipline for sound money. Well, the fact is, the bond and the stock markets were the discipline. They said, we don't like this inflation, stop it. And Reagan was elected, and, and Volcker became the Fed chairman, and he was anti-inflation. Uh, but yeah. Well, we should, we should wrap up soon, though. But all right, yeah, I'll, so. I'll wrap up with one final story. All right, so in 1975, a guy named uh, uh, Jerry Smith, who was a gold bug, and he'd written a book called uh, se uh, 70s uh, Prof Silver Profits in the 70s. That was the name of his special book. 
And he made the prediction, he said silver will double and then double again. And he was right, so everybody listened to what he had to say. Well, he got up and said one time in 1975, within five years the dollar will be worthless. Well, I wrote that down, I said, wow, that's an incredible prediction. Five years, the dollar will be worthless. So five years came and went, we still had money in our pockets, and I happened by accident to be sitting next to Jerry Smith at dinner one night. And I turned to him and I said, Jerry, what about this crazy prediction? I remember it five years ago when you said the dollar would be worthless. And here we have all this money and, and we're still here and it's not a problem. What do you say to that, Mr. Smith? He says, Mark, Mark, you misunderstood what I said. What I really said was the dollar will be worth less. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all about the syntax. Thank you all for coming. I'll sign Thank some books you. out there, if you're, or right here with my wife. If you're interested. Thank you.